so you can start whenever you like. Okay. Um, so welcome to this uh, digital citizenship panel with uh, thinking about integrative thinking um, in the classroom and how it uh, can support citizenship. Um, my name is Josie Hong. I'm the director of the I Think uh, Initiative, uh, which is a non-profit non organization who was born out of the Rotten School of Management to use creative problem-solving techniques and to bring it to the classroom to see what we started off is to see what kind of impact it might make. And um, today we have two teachers here who do a lot of work in integrative thinking because while I have worked with these teachers, they know what's happening in the classroom and how integrative thinking is going. So, so um, maybe if you guys can introduce yourselves and then maybe I should go around the room and have everyone kind of say their name and where they're from just so that we have sense. Sure. Uh, my name is Erin Quim. Um, I teach grade seven this year, but grade eight, grade one, two, you know, elementary, all over the place. <laughs> um, I started my I Think journey in 2014 uh, with a one-day session uh, that kind of ignited my um, my teaching practice, and I kind of haven't looked back since. We kind of talk about drinking the Kool-Aid, and um, that Kool-Aid involves not only the thinking that our students do in the classroom, but the network of teachers that you get to know. Um, outside that helps support um, all these wonderful tools and yeah, I'm excited to be here <coughs> to learn from you guys too. What's going on? Awesome. Uh, my name is Raheem Isabai. I'm a grade 11 and 12 teacher at John Polani Collegiate Institute. Uh, we're only about six or seven years old. Uh, old Bathurst Heights if we know the city and um, uh, business leadership we actually created the integrated thinking course from all throughout business leadership so we don't teach the the big massive management fundamentals textbook we actually have created the course about uh, six or seven years ago uh, with another lovely girl Nova Thornburg who can be with us today she's the associate director at uh, IP um, and we're very blessed to do a lot of great projects in and out of the classroom with our students uh, and I'd be happy to share some of that stuff uh, as well as you so I know you just got in here, Dwight, so take a few seconds, talk about yourself, what school, where you teach, why you're here, uh, one, two, three, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Dwight Beer, I'm with the Waterloo Region District School Board. Nice. Um, I had been a teacher, but now I'm a network analyst. Susan Armstrong, I'm from uh, Independent School near Peterborough. Uh, my tech director, and my role as director is more towards training and integration of the classroom. I'm Jeff Bruce. I'm the uh, principal of West Mountain Public School. I'm Leslie Robertson. I am a teacher librarian uh, with the Thames Valley District School Board, and we are embarking our school on a new initiative called School Within a School, where we're trying to um, do problem-based learning, um, community partnerships. So I was wondering if this might be something like this. <laughs> <Definitely>. Good. <laughs> Uh, my name is Anne He. Um, I'm currently working as a digital media collaborator at the University of Guelph. Um, and I'm part of the brand new media studio that we have in the library. So right now we're in the process of creating library guides on digital citizenship. We also go into classrooms and do individual sessions on digital tech. Terry Whitmell, I'm principal at Cawther Park Secondary School in Peel Region, which is a regional arts program, but a really strong academic uh, school as well. Sure. Uh, I'm Brock Baker. I'm a, a high school educator. I'm involved with a lot of provincial projects, uh, including the online student chat, which we presented earlier today, um, uh, a student-led conference called Own Your Ed, and uh, always looking at how to create uh, community, school relationships, and put that all those out there. So. Uh, I'm Andrew Boronsky. I was a secondary English teacher for the past 10 years and just started as a consultant on the Waterloo Region, Waterloo Region District School Board. Uh, and I also am the founder and director of TEDx Nature Ed, which is a TEDx event focused in the educational space. Keith O'Young, I'm an ESL teacher at a high school in New York. So, how, uh, do folks are folks familiar with integrative thinking? <coughs> You've never seen it a little bit? <coughs> Should I run the intro just to, yeah. it's a three minute video, it kind of gives a bit of overview. This was, uh, come on in, thank you, sorry. No worries. Come on in. Sorry. Oh, it's really easy. <laughs> I know, it's really easy. These chairs are great.
lot of well, you have driven some <laughs> yeah, a lot of you have driven some ways to get here today, which is awesome. Yeah. Waterloo, so I, I graduated from Wilfrid Murray, so I spent some time in K dubs. Yeah. <laughs> you guys wanna just quickly introduce yourselves while we wait for a technical to you should just kind of share names and why why you're here and what you do. Sure. So uh, my name is Angela. I am the principal of the school just north of the city. And from York Catholic, just a school board, St. Padre Pio, who's two of my fabulous teachers, they're exemplary. Um, last year they put in, they created a proposal for TLP for the ministry, and uh, we just want to learn as much as we can about digital citizenship and uh, what we can do to bring our students to engage and further in the curriculum and beyond. I'm a grade three teacher. I'm uh, grade 12, grade 4 teacher in the same school. We have not been able to overcome technical difficulties. My computer is completely frozen, so we're just going to go through the live version of it. Um, uh, Integrative Thinking was developed by Roger Martin um, just over 10 years ago uh, in his book called Pupils of the Mind. Uh, and fundamentally, he came to Integrative Thinking after working with them hundreds of leaders in across different industries. And what he realized was that what leaders were doing were who had been making a significant change in their community and in their industry was that the leaders weren't simply just choosing between A versus B. They were actually going out and engaging with problem solving in a way where they started um, exploring both possibilities, taking the most, best of both to create a new possibility. And so about seven years ago, um, I think this started because um, a student of Rogers essentially said, you know, this is type of thinking we need to have happen all the time. It's not just something you learn when you're in your master's program. Why aren't we teaching in K-12? And so for the last seven years, I think it's been exploring what does it look like to bring integrative thinking, design thinking, and essentially create creative problem solving techniques into the K-12 environment. And so with help with from teachers like um, Aaron Rahim, we've shown that integrative thinking can be taught from kindergarten all the way down to when we first worked with integrative thinking, we thought, we'll just teach methodology, and as soon as we teach the process, once the teachers know it, our job will be done. And what these amazing teachers have actually shown us is that using integrative thinking in the classroom shifts how students think about creativity, collaboration, and group thinking. And so what we realized is that the tools of integrative thinking, the process of how do you get from two divergent options and create an even better one, how do you share your thinking, how do you work with others? How do you manage your complexity? These are the types of things that is something that is going on for the process that we're working with all the time. And so I think is now here to not just help teach creative integrative thinking in the classroom, but also support a community of educators to bring integrative thinking into their daily work. So um, when we heard when we were invited to speak at this digital citizenship panel, we thought, what better way than to bring some teachers who've been actually doing it and talk a little bit about what citizenship looks like in their classroom and how integrative thinking helps. So I've prepped a few questions, but given the group size, I think this should just be a discussion. Yeah. So I will launch with the first question, um, and feel free to chime in, and if I just hear crickets, I'm just gonna chime in with some more questions. Mm -hmm. um, so Raheem, Aaron, um, what does citizenship mean to you, and what does it look like in the classroom? Um, <clears throat> For me, I think citizenship boils down to with all the work that I've done with students in and outside of the classroom, and even personally myself, I think it's the motivation and the engagement to actually, you know, research, think, and actually act upon something that you feel quite profoundly about. Um, to me, citizenship is truly about uh, not only answering a subject, or uh, as we do have many problems in the world and we want to answer uh, a problem, it's how do we make the world better for that particular person at that given time. To me, that's what citizenship is. Um, in real time. Yeah, and I think um, it's nice to actually have to think about this question <laughs> and to try to articulate um, what citizenship means to me and the students. I think it really comes down to um, how do my students understand the relationships they have with people and the empathy that they have to build in order to um, become better citizens themselves. Um, and I know we'll get further into it, but I feel trying to teach empathy is much harder than I ever thought it would be. <laughs> um, you can talk about someone being empathetic and what that looks like, but how do you get someone to actually be empathetic? And I find a lot of times with the tools that are provided through integrative thinking, 
you're able to have some more concrete um, conversations about it where you can actually see their thinking in an empathetic way. Um, and I think creating those types of citizens will create a better, hopefully, a better world for, for them moving forward. So give us an example. What does that look like? Um, so I think uh, one of the things that stood out, um, particularly this year, um, we were looking down at the Tommy Thompson Park, Leslie Street Spit, if anyone is familiar with it, and we were doing a program with um, Rotman and looking at how to better use that space. Should it be a space just for um, conservation, so the only people in are guided tours and then everything else is left on its own, or do you open it up just like a public park for everyone to, to witness it? Um, and this was a challenge that we brought forth to um, teachers that we're going to take back to their classrooms. And what I found really interesting was um, the teachers, their shift and their empathy towards the natural space. So it started off like, oh, everyone should be in here. Everyone should um, see all that has to do in this park. Um, and then all of a sudden I started talking about, well, if everyone's just here, like they're going to step on the snakes. Oh my goodness, we can't step on the snakes. Or look at these snails. Oh my goodness, there's all these snails everywhere. We can't step on them. No one should be allowed in this park. No one come to this park. We need to like keep it safe for every natural being in there. Um, and so their empathy towards the natural space was really interesting. And then the switch over the following day when the park was open to the public, how people were able to see, okay, we have to be careful of the snakes and of the snails. And we can't bring in just any animal because it'll disrupt the reproductive patterns of the, nat the birds that are here. Um, and it was interesting to see the way they could have so much empathy towards the natural space just by experiencing it. And they've come to let me know that their students are having the same empathy and that it's changing the way they're seeing the space and that, yeah, they want everyone to see it because education is important because without that, how are you supposed to understand um, to make that a better space? Um, so I found that really, really insightful to see the way adults can actually shift their thinking um, and their empathy because sometimes we can be very caught in our own models um, and to see students do the same thing is really, really important. You know? And Raheem, you've done, you've done a lot of work on students get out of the classroom yes, yes. Um, and shift their thinking. Yeah. What does it look like? So in our grade 12 business leadership class, which is an integrative thinking class, uh, we first teach them, we define what leadership is about, we define what it looks like, um, how it hasn't worked in so many places, um, and allows them to define how they are as, as they want to be as a citizenship, uh, as a citizen. Uh, we then do a lot of things in the community, uh, whether it be a reading buddy program in a local grade one two classroom, uh, I have kids right now. Even during class time, we go to the North Rock Harvest Food Bank and we help out at the food bank as well. And, and what ends up happening is that as their feet end up going outside of the classroom, they obviously once again have that change and shift as, as understanding of what their value is and, and and what their role is in creating this earth. Um, and then from there, what we do for the last two months, I don't teach anymore. My, my course is done because we've gone through the tools of integrative thinking, and from there they actually use the tools to consult to a real life organization. So that's the last two months of this. So that's their culminating project. Uh, and what I do is we, we put them into teams. So there's a project manager, there's a, a marketing manager, and they end up providing recommendations to a real life problem that a um, a, a client is facing. So we've consulted to people like um, North Recovery Food Bank. After the Peace Program, um, Wounded Warriors, we consulted to Tommy Thompson Park, Toronto Rocks and uh, Toronto uh, TRCA, so Toronto Region and Conservation Authority. We've also consulted to Metrolinks, which was really cool. We consulted to the University of Toronto, the Innovation Hub. This semester, we're actually consulting to um, Baycrest Health Sciences, actually. So we're consulting to the Director of Innovation and Education. Um, and what ends up happening is that they're going to be pitching us a challenge and then my kids in their groups will be using the tools of integrative thinking to provide recommendations to them uh, in about two months from now. So it's very hands-on. Uh, they not only go out of the classroom to receive the challenge, but then they have to do a lot of field research. They have to have an empathetic uh, field research experiment. So how do they get some additional research to the challenge? by doing something else outside of the classroom. So for me, you know, my personal philosophy, um, every kid, every student, every teacher, one foot in, one foot out of the classroom at all times of the year. Uh, we can't be confined to, you know, four walls, a ceiling, and a roof. The learning, the real learning happens outside. And we've been blessed uh, 
to create a course which not only allows for it, uh, but allows our kids to excel and truly, you know, truly question who they are as people. Uh, and, and that's where I think the beauty of what integrative thinking has not only allowed me to do, but uh, which has definitely pushed it onto the kids. And, and you know, we'll go into some of the changes I've seen with my students over the years now that we've taught it for about six or seven. Ask, please ask. Yeah, I know I heard a lot of things about partnerships and going outside of the classroom. So your partnerships, are they are the kids seeking out uh, based on their passion? They have to find their partnership or do you have some of these people already look, you know what I mean? Like how do you create exactly those partnerships? So I'll, I'll tell you how the journey has evolved. Okay. So I've been blessed to be, even though as a, a business teacher and also uh, a co-op teacher, I've always had one foot in, one foot out. So I've had a chance to have my kids actually do a co-op placement at the North Park School Bank and at these programs. So as a result, I already have relationships with people that are on uh, in their management. Uh, so and once I talk to them about what the school is about and then pitch them that we can help solve one of their challenges, and, and it's such a small ask. I'm only asking for about four to five hours of their time over a five month period. Uh, a lot of them are very happy to do so because you know, especially our non-for-profit partners, uh, this acts as you know part of their community awareness mandate as well. So it, it definitely has a lot of checks for them. Um, so for me, I'm very lucky to be outside of the classroom and do a lot of things. Uh, and, and it's evolved from there. From my first class that we taught with NOGA, we did each group consult to a specific organization. So the first time we ran this class, we had a group consulting to the Northern Harvest Food Bank, the PAC program, and also Pathways to Education, and then I think it was CSI, the Social Innovation Hub uh, down our region partner. So with that was a nightmare, because for each team, you'd have to set up a meeting. So I invited all of the director of or EDs or whoever would be the management to come in to pitch the program. And then we'd have to organize a day or two days where then the kids would volunteer with the organization and then go check out what they're about on their end. Because they have to, to understand your client, you gotta understand you know, it's not just about looking at what's on the website. They have to have a chance to you know, see what clients they work with, what are the challenges that they face on a daily basis, you know, talking to other their employees. So setting that up times four was a nightmare. And then as we moved forward, we started looking at, okay, let's try and do just two organizations. So as a result, each organization would have two student groups working on it. And then we're getting to a point where, okay, we're going to be doing one organization because a lot of people stop picking up my phone calls now because <laughs> I've asked for a lot of uh, the people around me. And um, now we take one specific organization and one challenge, but with integrative thinking, we have the use of the opposable tensions. And I know we'll talk about the idea of tensions, and these are basically gateways and interpretations of you know, how we could solve some of these challenges. So now I just have one client and each group works through a specific tension. So it's their own interpretation and they end up getting to similar places, but they have to do different research to get there. So that's the model that we're currently using, yeah, which is a lot easier on me <laughs> uh, and then also easier on the class. Then we can go in depth with that. So now, actually we already have sorted out the entire semester, uh, which I'm actually I have a draft of an email to these ladies about what's happening. So, like November 14th, we're going down for a two hour visit uh, to not only visit and make rest help, but then to have a one hour sit down uh, with the, both directors and a couple of doctors to talk more about the challenge. And then they're going to be coming to our classroom uh, in December before the break to see how they're doing, to see how, you know, where, where has their research led them to. And then in January, we're actually going to be doing the presentations, which normally we do at Integrative Thinking. So we invite parents, we invite all the people who we consulted to, I invite even previous students, you know, we invite other teachers that are interested in how we do it in this classroom. But this year they offered to do it actually at Baycrest Health, which is pretty cool. Uh, and they have a really cool space there that's a really innovative space uh, and, and it'll be pretty special. So if you find a partner that is, you know, gung-ho, and especially it's the Director of Education and Innovation, who's really cool, and we're working on uh, another project with them with our science kids, we're trying to build a stronger partnership between our two facilities, so it, it just has worked out uh, that we're doing this. And I'm already starting, um, already having conversations about next semester's uh, client who might be our MP, Marco Mendocino. Yeah. 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 Y
So I did already have a con yeah, it's all new to her, so she doesn't know about this stuff, and <laughs> Noka doesn't either, so uh, I try and get the, the fact before I go to them, and then I ask them for help, and, and I always usually need it when it comes to uh, integrative intricacies. But yeah, so those are the different models we've had to shift over the years, uh, because the time, but then there was also one semester that I wrote a letter, and then I gave it to all the kids, because now a lot of our kids have cousins and uncles and you know a mom or an aunt works here or you know I have my you know cousin doing a co-op at this company and if they have a cool manager maybe they can be our clients because it got to a point where I had people not taking my phone calls anymore so there's uh, there's so many different models it all depends on you know what works with what you have and you know to me it's all about momentum so if you start inviting people in and to see what the kids are able to do. That, if to me, is gold, and that's when you have, you know, you know, people telling you months in advance, okay, I want to be uh, the next challenge for you. Last semester, we consulted two um, executive directors and director of education, John Malloy. Uh, so they were not only in our class, but then also we consulted to them and gave us a real challenge, a real life challenge that they're working on right now, which is uh, our full integration of students into one classroom. So our kids had a chance to provide some insight, and you know. We're not trying to solve the entire problem because these problems have been around for decades, but if we can provide insight to the adults that are making the decisions moving forward, and if that can come from a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old, that to me is gold. That to me is more powerful than any reflection, than any writing piece whatsoever. That interaction and getting that adult who's three times, two times, like a 17-year-old age, like, hey, next time I go into a meeting, I'm going to use what that kid said. That is not only the biggest compliment to a kid, but that also shifts what our leaders are thinking. And that's what we're trying to do. And integrative thinking has given us the opportunity to do that. So Leslie, I'm hearing behind your question is like, students have passions, you have limited capacity. How do you think about finding the right challenge for the classroom? So I'm, Aaron, you, you, you do some of that as well. Huh? Yeah, and I think just to kind of build on what you're saying, like these, we're asking our students to like deal with very complex issues. And I think that's what I always come back to um, with my students. Like, we're asking them to talk about climate change. We're asking them to think about immigration. We're asking them to think about um, reconciliation. Like we're asking them to deal with these very complex issues that adults aren't able to handle or come up with recommendations for. So how do we give them tools to navigate through this complex world? And um, I found that the tools of integrative thinking allows them to, to have a grasp on this complex world that we're asking them to live in and continue to live in and, and try to make changes to. Um, so I know one of the things that we did this year was the one of the tools causal models, um, where it looks at cause and effect, but the complexity of a cause and effect relationship. Um, and I always start my my year of looking at traffic congestion because uh, I don't know it's like where you guys are from and <laughs> uh, where your your schools are situated, but my schools are situated in a way that um, traffic is a hard issue for kids to get to school, for their parents to drop them off and take them places for TTC. Um, public transit to get, buses are always late. Um, so we talk about the complex issue of traffic congestion and get them to kind of navigate through causal models. What is the cause of traffic congestion? What are some, some actions that happen with traffic congestion that maybe you can take control of? Um, and they always come up with, like you're saying, like very interesting solutions um, to these complex issues, which lets me know, okay, they're invested in in this because they've come they've looked at the data that they've selected and that they've, they've figured out and they've come up with a solution not always my favorite solutions as someone that actually drives <laughs> uh, one of their solutions when they're looking at traffic congestion they said okay well one of the major factors or actions where all of these cause and effect are coming into is um, speed speed is causing um, accidents speed is causing people to be distracted so they decide to deal with speed um, their recommendation was that they would in every car there would be an automatic ticket dispenser. So the minute you go over the speed limit, it automatically dispenses your ticket. Yeah, not a and good like, idea. Yeah, not so I was idea. like, that's great, you clearly don't drive and understand the speed to get from point A to point B, but would it cause some people to slow down? Yes. Certainly, I'm definitely not going over if the ticket's gonna be automatically dispensed. Um, another thing that they came up with was like, um, everyone would get on like a trolley, you could just trolley your car because another issue they saw where all the no's were coming to was too many cars on the roads. So well let's just take the cars off the roads and we can just take this 
like beam almost like a and send them down they could just click their car into this gondola like thing and their car would just be directly sent to whatever location they need to go to so they're looking at the world in a way that I'm not looking at it and that's so refreshing to me and it it's refreshing in a way that okay there's hope for the future that maybe we'll be able to to deal with some of these solutions in a more creative more interesting way and um, and that's and it wouldn't have happened without some of the tools of integrate thinking to be really tangible in and how they, they dealt with some of these, these complex issues. Hope that answers your question. A nice long, <laughs> yeah. long ago way. Yeah, <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I hope it gave you more questions. And, that's the and I come to at this from an elementary school lens too. Um, but what something that's happening in our school board is under this umbrella is they're combining a lot of credits. So we have like the art of math right now, and then through problem-based learning and community partnerships, and then they're getting their math and their science credits, and we have science and math together, and quite a few others. I mean, that's easy to do in the elementary school, yeah. 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 anyways, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, we did a big um, project down at Dufferin Grove Park, was looking to reimagine the space. So I was like, perfect, yeah, we're in. That sounds just up our alley, so we went there and we had the kids. Um, navigate through the park and ask the people at the park what they were looking for, what what kind of space were they, they trying to imagine. They're like, we don't know. That's that's why we've opened it up to the public. Um, and so the kids went in and, and took a look at the space. And it was interesting the way they looked at it was more from an accessibility standpoint. Uh, and maybe that's because the school I was at, um, we're all one floor, we have an intensive support program, so maybe it was part of their viewpoint, but it wasn't part of the viewpoint of the park staff. So their recommendations to them was more about accessibility for everyone uh, in the park and then to also create more space for the kids to play as opposed to a lot of them were like, well, how can we get the bikes back and forth through the park more safely? When they're like, well, the bikes will go through no matter what. What about everything else that's going on in the park? Um, and there, there you have, like, we talked. they talked about adding in solar panels so that they could um, have these pizza ovens running cool. all day long. Um, and there's so many elements of the curriculum that went into it without even, like, they came up with it and you're able to, to meld those so easily in just finding these problems that they're interested in. They're going to they're gonna fill in those those places, right? Uh, I'm wondering, Raheem, uh, yeah. at the secondary level, yes. uh, your projects are completely disciplinary. Have you had success or have you tried to combined with other curricular areas, so other teachers, to make that a uh, whole afternoon. That was so. That was the goal this semester yeah. to connect with Nicole Anthony's. Uh, she does a bio something. She's STEM yeah. to the max, and she just won the Prime Minister's Award last year uh, for STEM. Um, she's phenomenal. She will be asked to be a dean one day pretty soon. Um, she runs the all girls conference, STEM conference, which happens on International Women's Day, so she is, um, she's amazing, she's a force. So I wanted to connect with her team because she does an IDC course, which she actually created yeah. in regards to bio and something, <coughs> I don't even, I can't even explain it. I stay on the business and tech side and she does the other side. Um, however, the challenge that we got from our client was about, we're actually going to be helping out with how do you optimize recruitment for doctoral candidates. So I was thinking if it was more of a science-y tinge to it, we could have easily brought the two classes together and then done, that was the original goal. We had that, we had that chat in summer, but then when we actually found a chance to connect with the client and it's been actually a conversation for over three or four months now to actually you know, get to a challenge that, um, that is something that the client is, is keeps them up at night, uh, but also something that our kids can sink into. Because our kids are now, Basically, they're applying to colleges, universities. They're, you know, we have a basketball program that we're, you know, coaches from the states are coming to. So our kids can relate to the challenge. And once you can find a challenge where our kids can relate to, it just makes things a little bit more easier and fluent. Uh, so this time it didn't happen, but that is my goal. My goal is to now connect other classes together on working on one challenge. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, great question. But we're also working on something else that's has some integrative thinking kids into it. Which is a uh, which we can talk about later. It's a it's, it's a project on neurology at the Baycrest Health, uh, and it, it's bringing kids from all across all the disciplines that are going to all the different places. So that's one of our cross-sectional teams that we've started, which was a 
conversation that happened two years ago that now actually came to fruition. But we can talk about that more outside. Good question. So kind of along the lines of what you were saying, when, it, when we talk about citizenship in the classroom, what are the areas that you find challenging? What are the areas that you are kind of would love to learn, think a little bit more about? I'm, like I'm, we're having conversations about how to um, take kids into the community. Yep. Um, to help them build that empathy. And I, I, you know, we have a food bank, and we're in Vaughan. And so, okay, we, and we go as a staff nice. on our faith day, but what's what we do? We go to the food bank. And um, so we want to take them to do that experience. But I'm sitting here thinking, where else can I take them? Where else can we take them in Vaughan? Right? And I think that is something that I, I, I need to maybe, you know. So you're talking about proximity and location? Or yes, because we're, we're elementary school, so even just proximity and location. You know, we deal with the issues of the busing. The buses, yes. we share the busing with the other school board. Yes. They got to be back by 2.30. It's yeah. all these right. things that impede the bigger picture, right? So but you have to, the logistics of it. Around. So I'm just here sitting there thinking, where else can I take these kids? So if you if you can just give me some ideas and I can see where I can connect it to. Like, where else have you gone? Somebody yeah, go ahead, brother. Uh, this is a digital citizenship conference. You yeah. take them digital. Yeah. You take them virtual. Yeah. Uh, whether it's Skype in the classroom, Google, uh, Hangouts, um, in Canada, yeah, yeah, in Canada here, yeah, the Digital Human Library is a great uh, resource where you can go anywhere and connect digital with just human the Digital Human Library right. and the library. <laughs> my, my daughter, oh, it's like a library. Um, yeah, the Digital Human Library, check out. Um, lots of lots stuff there. Also with uh, Google and Google Classroom stuff, yes. uh, we just got a uh, Mr. Mohammed who teaches computer science and a bunch of other things. Uh, we just got a kit for VR stuff. So um, if you put your phone in into the, the, yes. the cardboard yeah. box, yeah. and then we were like on top of the Amazon, like in, in like a second, or walking on top of Mount Everest or whatever it may be, or you know walk around uh, the Kaaba in, in Saudi. Like it, it was it was very powerful, and, and the kids definitely took to it. And you know, if you use the actual tool, you can actually put the pinpoints of where you want the kids to see, which was very special as well. So you can even program the type of experience that the kids want to have using this technology, and you're just you're in your classroom. So I think that can be a precursor to something else. Like that can be the hook to something else that you might want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Thank course. you. Yes, but you know, I was just gonna, go ahead to it, the the, um, the research that's coming out on the power of virtual reality to instill empathy. Um, you can be, you know, anywhere on top of the Amazon's awesome, uh, but you can be in a refugee camp. You can witness a hate crime in front of you in, in a way that you just can't describe. Um, so if you can find those resources in yeah. VR and Google, it's, you know. Is this a human contact, right? It's that human contact. It's, it, yeah, it's, that, it's that the human experience. The visceral change. experience of yes. being there and you know, putting yourself in that situation, um, powerful stuff. The other thing that um, is incredibly powerful for building empathy is actually, making, to your point, making that human to human connection. And so often it's about um, how do you bring um, individuals and organizations who can help build the conversation into your classroom, and how do you help your students to ask powerful questions that really explore their other person's experience and the other person's understanding. It's not about it's not about asking them, you know, sp the specifics of the situation, but actually, what was their experience? Like. And so, um, I don't know if you see that in a classroom where you know, you know, you know the, the tell me more and why. It yeah, and I think um, even before that, I've only read this year. Only this year have I actually got them to think about their own values. I think we asked them to go out and. Um, ask these questions and, and figure out how other people feel, but what about themselves? What do they value as as individuals? Um, and again, through the I think community, Jen Warren, um, and I think Heidi ZIF also did this, but they did, did a causal model, um, a values causal model. So each student had to figure out four to five things that they value to themselves and then piece back, okay, what, what caused me to value that? And 
Um, that's been a very powerful piece in my school and in my classroom this year for them to actually think about, well, why do I think that I, I value happiness? Why do I value family? Right? Because those are things that, well, I've been told, like, I just value them. Well, what caused you to value? What are some events in your life that led you to value that? And by delving deeper into that, then they can, if they're going out into the world, they can understand if someone else values va their family, well, what caused them to value their family? Because it could be different than the reason I value my family. Um, and I think some of those pieces allow you to then have them be better citizens because they have a better understanding of their own values to then try to know that someone else's values, there's going to be many stories involved in, in that. And it's those stories that they share and, and ask about that's going to make them understand and empathize with others more. And, and we use the words, tell me more, and yes, and. Um, I have it like right on my laptop, it's yes, and, and my students are always, well, why do you have yes, and? I'm like, well, it, it just opens up a conversation. And if I say yes, but, I'm, I'm already shutting you down, and I want to open myself up to all the possibilities of conversations, um, because that mindset's going to allow me to better understand the world I live in. I don't know, I don't understand everything, I can't know everything, uh, but I want to open up to that. I'm wondering about uh, how explicit you are in your talk of citizenship and um, tracking of the student students understanding and responses to citizenship <coughs> proper. I mean, is it a business leadership course and in elementary, depending on the situation, I mean, there's a lot of citizenship skills uh, that are gonna be there, but I'm wondering, do you, do you highlight them explicitly and get them to reflect upon it so they can articulate it moving forward and can they track that learning from the beginning to the end? Have you done that research? Like how how much have they improved at this? Even though like the, qualitatively you know it's gotten a hell of a lot better. I'm just wondering is there that before and after kind of snapshots? I, like trying to track, it's, <laughs> I would say it's like a number one thing that comes up. Like how do we track their growth? Like how do we track like how they've changed as individuals? Like great question I would like how do I actually go about doing that other than seeing the way that they interact with their peers so, right? so you're not actively trying to do that uh, are you getting them to do it so I wouldn't say in a very specific way okay. no and I'm, I it's definitely it's a struggle that we constantly have and I'm constantly trying to figure out how can I actually say how they got from point A to point B other than I see the way they interact or the way they use tools or the way their writing changes or like I I don't know how to at this point, quantitative empathy. <laughs> like, how do I how do I do that? Do they have digital portfolios yeah. like a Google site that they document their journey at all? So or? we have all their all of their pieces. They hold on to them, and we kind of see how they like. I my very first one with for a causal model where there wasn't like any real extent on it. Um, sometimes they'll go back to their causal models and they'll build off of them once they have more information. Um, but yeah, they have portfolios where they're holding on to things, and then I can see, I can see, but I don't know if necessarily, maybe they see it, yeah. So for us to add to that, yeah. you know, um, the beauty of this course is that we don't have a re prerequisite for it. Uh, it might be a business leadership class, but we don't have a business prerequisite to it, which is great. So um, it's like teaching a critical thinking class. It's for everyone, people that want to do some work. Uh, and a big piece of our course is endless reflection. So from readings from Malcolm Gladwell to Daniel Kahneman to you know all kinds of different stuff, we read Roger's book and specific chapters. You know all throughout it, uh, I'm getting them to not only reflect reflect upon the themes of leadership, but like so why should you give a damn about what's coming up here? So what ends up happening is through their readings, I and, and their writings, I start tracking how you know from the beginning reflection, it, it's a, a more of summary of content and then a bit of their thinking. And then to their last reflection, it's just like going off in multiple tangents. So that on its own is one you know indicator for me. Uh, another indicator for me is you know in their final projects, they're with the team uh, for about seven weeks, um, and there's always a point where you know ultimately get into some sort of argument or it's constant or there's breakups in the groups. Um, but you know I had one kid say in their final reflection of the class, and I always have to do a, a class reflection as well after the five months. And this is a, a student who said, you know, when I first came into Canada, when I first came into this class, you know, working with kids from a particular color, I didn't expect too much of them. However, now my whole world has changed as to what can I can, you know, what can I think of when I look at people now. 
So that's a massive reflection that I'll always keep on having. Noga talks about that reflection as well. You know, a third thing that I also keep a track on, you know, at, at the beginning of the course, um, a lot of our kids are quick to conclude and quick to say that things are, you know, uh, are a particular way. As the year progresses and as the course progresses, before the conclusions pop up, questions pop up. And when I start seeing that change of questioning first versus going straight to a conclusion, that's to me massive change. Like those are the wins that if I can do that in five months with a 17 year old kid, with this 18 year old kid that has already been programmed in a way that we are trying to unprogram, and we talk about that all the time, you know, to me that's leaps and bounds. To add on to that, I'll, I'll give another story. One of our integrative thinking kids, uh, who is also part of my team, uh, YYZ uh, City Change Event in Toronto Zoo, with the, which is an actor You might have saw them downstairs selling some stuff. Um, you know, she was a phenomenal, bright student. You know, um, come from a really interesting background. Father was Cuban, mother was German. Like, just really interesting, all about languages. And you know, she went to school wanting to be a corporate lawyer, okay? So she wanted to do languages and wanted to go to law school, so on and so forth. You know, after going to Glendon, who has a, they have international language, she has like five languages now. Um, she's now shifted with the work that we did in the class and the work that we did with extra curriculum, she's now shifting to be an immigration lawyer, which is very special, which is very interesting. And now she's volunteering at one of our local agencies that are helping our Syrian Afghanis coming into the world, or coming into Canada. So now when I start seeing my kids making massive shifts into their careers, and then because my course is grade 12, they go through a massive shift in terms of, okay, I wanted to do bio and tech, but then all of a sudden now I want to do something totally different. You know, those shifts and hearing those inner voices, to me, those are massive leaps and bounds. Because there's a point where we have our pot committed, especially when you're in grade 12, because you're expected to know where you want to go, and if you change, you're, you know, you're not as strong as you should be. And if these kids are having these conversations and then making real tangible changes, that is to me the work that we're doing here. That is the real work. So that to me is where I do my kind of evaluation. If, if, if the conversation changes and now it's more questioning and it's more research first than actually you know, going diving in, that to me is very special. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say those yeah. are wonderful stories. Yeah. It would be amazing to have the pre-interview oh, and yeah. post-interview. and. Yeah. So that's the next project me and the other teacher are working on. Yeah. Yeah. Podcast yeah. coming up. Give me about two Podcast years. <laughs> just a YouTube playlist. Yeah. And yeah. You have no problem getting people in your class. Yeah. But I, I want your class to grow to every school. Yeah. I want to hear your students' stories. I want I want that. I want to play that for my students and say, that this is this is what it's about. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah. But the, the, those interviews with kids for two minutes with set questions before and after. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise it's just our stories of what we observed, yeah. Yeah. whereas we get their voice involved. And then, and then go right. visit TEDx and go get yeah, them to put exactly. it up there for five minutes. And yeah. Then <laughs> drop it, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah. Questions were okay. I know we're talking a lot here. Happy to, <laughs> to make this as quite as interactive. But I know you all have questions and you can even share stuff with us. You know, I'm wondering more. about the communication that you see from students and, and do you see them be able to shift their communication skills based on the audience and uh, and uh, you know who they're working with uh, as as the, you know you work through your problems and is that something that you watch and, and track? Yes, yeah, for sure. Um, I think. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. No, oh yeah, because yours is very yeah, it's very focused. direct. Yeah. Yours is uh, a little all over the place. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, for our students, for those last two months in that final project. Know, one day they're speaking with their team, but then the next day they can have the client coming in, or the third day they can be going out and, and speaking to people in their community that can actually provide them some research. At the beginning, it's very difficult for them to turn on that light switch and say, hey, I'm in front of a client, or, or hey, I'm here. I need to be able to not only ask particular questions, but need to be fully engaged in the conversation. Uh, because, you know... And you have to explicitly teach them that? So what, what we end up doing is we watch a lot of Dave Letterman. You know, one, so one thing that I love bringing into the, the classroom is, you know, one of, uh, one of my favorite interviews with Dave Letterman with Serena Williams. And, and um, uh, we talk about, you know, how someone 
gets paid X amount, but then can have so many people eating out of his hand at a particular time, but then also get so much love out of someone and so much insight out of someone who be, he, he or she may not have, a, have any sort of relationship with. When our kids can understand that there's an art in you know, communicating, and, and for that for that to be at the top of their list versus down trying to get through all their 15 questions, that's an art. And that's one thing that I spend a lot of time on uh, because they have to, they have no choice. They're representing not only the class, they're representing me, they're representing our school, they're representing the theory of thinking as well. And I tell them that A, they're only here because of the work of the previous generations and it's your job to build and create more paths for the future generations, so you need to take this seriously. And once we create that value system, I say, hey, this is why we actually have this chance to consult to Metrolinx or you know, Toronto Region of Privacy and Conservation and so on and so forth. Hey, you know, I need to start taking this a little bit more serious than I would a regular project. Yeah. I hope that kind of yeah, that's answers great. your Thank question. You. And then they also do a final presentation, which is a presentation they've never done before because you know they're used to doing PowerPoints and Prezi's with an entire you know paragraph and they just stand there and read off the screen and then they do these things and then we tell them that hey that's not the way you present that's a digital aid you're the presenter on every slide you shouldn't have more than eight words or two pictures and then all of a sudden the focus point is on you so for them to have that shift and to do a pretty strong presentation uh, in front of we presented in front of 150 people we presented in front of the presentation that we had at Metrolinx, which was in the big room, remember it was in the big, the massive, massive room at, at Rothman, there was over 175 people there, including the management of Metrolinx, and isn't that the time we had... Mitzi Hunter. Mitzi Hunter was there yeah, that day. Yeah, that's right. Mitzi Hunter was there that day, and we had, a, we had parents there, we had so many, because we had kids presenting, yeah. and we had you know, my kids, so it was like a, it was a beautiful showcase, and my kids were scared. <laughs> scared, right? and, and the beauty of my course is without, you know, my course is great in the sense that I have the basketball guys, I have newcomers, I have, you know, our kids with high academics, I have our kids that are, you know, awesome in front of people but aren't the strongest academically. So it's the mishmash that actually adds to the beauty of what we come up with because the mishmash also brings in the different forms of life, the different forms of histories. Because in integrative thinking, we cherish people's biases. We cherish the goggles that you wear, and then we try and break them, right? We then we try and show you the other side of things, uh, and, and for you to, you know, uh, to not only question, uh, to stop questioning others, and to turn inwards. That's what our course is really about. How do we use integrative thinking and the tools to focus our, our work inwards and say, why do I interact in the world, and why do I see the world that I currently do? Because there's obviously eight point some odd billion people in this world, they all don't look at the world the exact same way. And if I can have them all sit around a table, we can probably finally solve some of these challenges, like at the refugee camps. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, I, I think that's pretty powerful, very powerful. So I want to go on that question in a slightly different way. I think what what you're you're asking about is, you know, how do I, how do we help our students build our build their confidence to be able to speak to others, speak to in different contexts. Um, one of the things that we've seen at the elementary school level, certainly, um, is that students gain their confidence to speak to others when they feel and have the opportunity to build their own voice and their own perspective. Um, and one of the tools of integrative thinking is what we call a pro-pro chart. And a pro-pro chart is simply saying, instead of saying, giving me a pro-con list of two different options, if two options are intention, you don't have to do a pro-con list, you can do a what's good on one side and what's good on the other, and you'll see benefits of both. Now, what we've seen students recognize is that by doing that, they're actually helping themselves to build their perspective of why they, what they value and why they value it. And so, um, even down to uh, grade one and grade two level, we've seen students who, at the outset of the year, um, selectively mute or are not willing to speak over the course of the year because they've had an opportunity to explore perspectives and find that they can contribute in different ways to that perspective. When they get in front of the folks and are asked a question, they have something that they're ready to talk about because they've seen something they value and they've something they can offer. Um, I don't know if you've seen that in your classroom in the variety of classes that you've taught, but um, what, what we've heard from the interviews and the research we've done is that it's about building their perspective and it has given them opportunity and a 
venue for them to share that. And it gives them, the tools just give them that, that visual, tangible piece, whereas before you can ask them to talk about what they think about, but here they are actually placing their value down or their perspective down for, for others to share and build upon. Right? It's all that yes and building piece to their perspective that they have an idea or they can see someone else's idea and build on that as opposed to feeling like I'm the only one with this this perspective and seeing that others have the same and, and they're able to actually physically place it down onto a piece of, of paper is, is very powerful for them. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've completely changed the way I teach people based on these tools. And um, not that my perspective wasn't that empathy was important, but um, being actually to see the, the use of the tools has helped my students to understand the, the power of, of empathy and perspective and, and being willing to open themselves up and listen to others. Like one of the activities we do right at the beginning is an interview where they can't say anything. The only two words they can say is yes and and tell me more. So they have a couple of pieces and that's what they do. They, they sit one on one with someone and they're forced just to listen and they can only say yes and tell me more. and. Getting grade seven eights to do that is incredible. <laughs> That's our first day of class too. Yeah. We do the exact same. Thing. Yeah, and forcing them to really just listen and be present and li and not think about what they're going to share because that's the life they live in, right? Like that constant like sharing of okay, here's my opinion. That's what I think. Okay, um, let me share this video with you or whatever, where they actually just sit and just listen to what someone has to share helps so much as the year goes on to value other people's opinions other people's perspectives by just sitting and saying, tell me more. Yes, like, it's, it's huge, right? So just to wrap things up, I have, oh, I have questions. Oh, sorry. How did you guys get involved in the I Think project? Uh, I showed up one day. <laughs> showed up one day. So they have a... So I did a one-day uh, essentials uh, okay. for leadership, um, and that essentials program is actually coming up on Monday. So it was a one-day program specifically for leadership that my principal said, hey, would you like Are to you go? To TDSB. Through TDSB, but it's open. I'll give yeah. you the short answer. Yeah. Okay. Just email us. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> we run Have you done any work with 10 to the Eastern School? Um, we don't think we've done any. I, a few, I know a few, a few folks have come. <laughs> a few folks have come from 10 to Valley. We haven't done any school work wide. Okay. Um, so I think um, it's not a proper organization. We offer um, open enrollment programs for any teacher who wants to sign up, but we also do partnership with school boards. So we've worked with York Region, um, TDSB, Hamilton, Hamilton Wentworth, uh, Noga Kornberg, the associate is in Kenora Catholic right now, um, working on a program there. So we do partnership with school boards to, to deliver this work as well. So um, just the best way to get uh, kind of contact us is at um, www.rotmaninehyphen.ca. Can you repeat that, sorry? www what? Um, www.rotmaninehyphen.ca. Uh, www you see the URL up there? Rotman, I think. R O T M A N I think. Yeah. 